Cool. Welcome our distinguished panel, including the great Daniel Buren. It's a great privilege to be here, uh, to be able to speak with him on his home turf uh, about his recent projects with comments and contribution from two such ideal interlocutors, Joël Pijodier Cabot, who since 2007 has been uh, director of the Musée de Strasbourg and who curated Daniel's uh, individual exhibition, the catalogue lying in front of us, uh, which is on, it was on until January, but it's been extended, I believe, until March now. Is that right, Joël? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's right. 8th of March, 8th, 8th of March uh, in Strasbourg. And Alfred Pacmont, uh, of course, for 13 years, director of the Musée National d'Art Moderne uh, at the Centre Georges Pompidou uh, until last year, and also curator of Liu Fan's uh, wonderful project at Versailles. And Mr. Lee, I'm very glad to say, is here also. So uh, I think the f it's an informal conversation, clearly, in this uh, setting uh, and in a busy time, uh, but we'll talk mainly about this year, because it's been an extraordinarily busy year, even by, by your standards, uh, Danielle. Um, maybe we should begin at the beginning of the year uh, in Mexico, Guadalajara, uh, a project that often your projects have, if I may say, a, a strong central visual idea or a strong thesis, a strong concept and m many developments around them. This project, it seems to me, I haven't been, but I've seen uh, images, uh, reproductions of it, seems an incredibly complex interaction with quite a complicated architecture. Um, can you just tell us something about how the project was conceived and developed? Good morning. <laughs> uh, very briefly, it's difficult to speak about something you maybe don't uh, know the situation. It's, a, it's an old uh, hospice built at the very end of the 18th century in Guadalajara in Mexico. It's a really beautiful, uh, extraordinary building which has been uh, uh, declared as uh, part of the uh, universal uh, treasure uh, a few years ago. And in fact, it's a very big uh, construction which is uh, based on a series of patios. And they have like 24 patios, which are all very different. So you have a mixture with something which is absolutely standard and repeating, which is the material, the simplicity. It's almost like a military construction. You have a huge uh, chapel, which is uh, also very famous because it's a huge uh, series of murals from uh, Orozco and you have a small chapel. So I use all the patios except uh, three, which are more private, like a school of uh, music, etc. And uh, so I use like uh, 21 or, twi or 21 patios, plus the small chapel, which is right in front of the big chapel where you have the fresco from uh, Orozco. And then, I did very different work uh, in this kind of uh, very strong decor, if we can say it so for the architecture, where you have a lot of things which uh, come back. You have the pillars, you have the stones, you have the uh, general configuration. And then, even if sometimes they are absolutely symmetrical, you never have exactly the same configuration. So some of these uh, patios have fountains, some are just with grass, some others with flowers and grass, some others only with stones. So you come one after one in a different setting even before I worked there. And uh, <clears throat> it's a little bit like a labyrinth because it's very big. And uh, you have beautiful uh, corridors going, pardon, we will stop that. <laughs> the, next, the next project. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the, the light, natural light, is of course absolutely beautiful. And without any picture, it's difficult to go further up, but I, I made uh, 21 or 22 plus the chapel, different works, including a kind of opposite uh, 
kind of a fresco on the small chapel in front of the big one from uh, Orozco. And it was very, very, uh, very intense because it was very difficult about Monet, very difficult about, uh, like, all the difficulties you have with uh, with national or historical monument. You cannot uh, neither put a nail, neither glue. Uh, you cannot do almost, you can do almost nothing. So to build everything I built for that exhibition was also a kind of uh, ingenious uh, tour de force in order to really take everything possible in the building, but without more or less touching to anything from the stones to I, the I think floor, it would be good to talk about that nature of collaboration, how a project develops, uh, obviously visually and intellectually in relation to the site, but also practically. But perhaps we can turn to Joël, since you're the most recent uh, collaborator on a big project. and. Um, I'd like to ask what may be a very mundane question. I'm sure I'll get a very sophisticated answer. But literally, when you when you invited Danielle to do a show in uh, your museum, did you have any idea what you would get? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say first, in Strasbourg, the situation was different than in uh, Guadalajara because uh, it was quite easy, and uh, our invitation was very open. So we proposed to Danielle to uh, create uh, artwork in the place he will choose in the museum. <coughs> so, perhaps some of you could know the museum. It's a big uh, front glass, which is uh, more than uh, 100 meters long, in front of the old city and in front of water. And inside, it's very high. And so uh, it's a sort of street, very high, and the room of exhibition are in part and in the other part. So uh, our proposition was very open. That is, Daniel could have worked inside in the collection or linked uh, to the architecture. And uh, we can guess he will decide to work on this big glass, front glass, what he did. Uh, and this work is very present in the city, in the urbanistic uh, area and, uh, and all the neighborhood as to deal with this work. You can see from outside. When you are inside, it, the, the room is very high. So here you have uh, a lot of play with the light and color, and you are really walking uh, in, the, in the light and in the color. And in the room of exhibition, he make a completely new work, uh, which is, uh, perhaps he will speak more better than me, a construction with elements like children plays with, with. So the title of the exhibition is Le Comme un jeu d'enfant. And uh, here he made a really new work in this sense. It's not a work in situ. It's more linked to the cabane, uh, uh, work situé in English. <laughs> but a special work in this sense, it can be moved to another place and reassembled in another way. So the two works were an answer, the first to the architecture of the town and the museum, and inside something more experimental and uh, totally new. <laughs> Daniel, could you say something about the, uh, th that work, the, the objects? Because I think I'm right in saying you work with space, you work with light, you work with color, form, objects, not so often. It's not a primary concern. Physical, three-dimensional form obviously is, is less of a, a sculptural form, is less of a concern. But in this case, it seems to be the, the, the primary component of the project. Everything done with, uh, directly with uh, light, the sun, uh, project the color in a way which has absolutely, to my eyes, nothing to do with the color when the color is applied to a material and uh, like a paint or whatsoever. So here we have a, really a very uh, nice, interesting situation where anyone can uh, see the uh, very different effect of this game extremely visual with the color applied directly to anything, a wall, material, 
and the color uh, projected. Projected as soon as the sun uh, show off, which uh, get quite often in Strasbourg in the summertime or during the day. And of course, like I did uh, for the one who saw it at uh, the um, Grand Palais and many, many different times since uh, many years as well. So I worked since a long time with the transparency, the projection, etc. And the piece which is uh, inside the museum, uh, the fact let's say of the new uh, aspect of the piece is the fact that I use something which everyone knows and which is uh, little cubes and boxes from each uh, little boy and little girl I think too play at one time when you have this little cube and you start to construct so really ready, ready made objects, ready made forms. Uh, the form in fact it's uh, manipulable <coughs> and which is more or less like that in most of the case and I took these uh, shapes which are absolutely basic it's a cube it's a rectangle the parallelepiped the triangle uh, and enlarge it uh, to uh, a different scale so this is absolutely banal in the art world to act this way so in a way the we can recognize these uh, very well-known shapes of a little uh, toy for children, but we are also completely uh, not submerged, but completely in a very different scale. And I think that changed completely the idea of the cube. It's more like a construction playing with simple form, which are used since, I think, the middle of the 19th century, which was uh, an invention by a German guy, if I am okay. not wrong, voilà. uh, which spread all around the world, this kind of uh, small objects which uh, everyone used one day or another. So that's the way, so in a way the piece has a kind of connection which uh, in, it's really not so often in my work, which is, we can say, it, even if it's totally abstract, it's a little more uh, figurative because we can connect to something which has another use. Uh, and then I play with the color, with that, not only with the difference between uh, what I said with the glass, uh, the vitrine, and uh, the paint directly, but the fact that uh, the, the room, which is a very large room of uh, a little more than 40 meters long, it's divided in two, white and colored. So the partition, which is uh, white, it's totally painted, the floors, the objects, etc., in white, and the rest is playing its game with the color, which, has exactly, which are exactly the color which we found in any box of a cube like that. So that's the way the, the work is, uh, is uh, position, positioned and also works in this room from uh, the same objects, totally white, and then very colorful. And I think the difference is really uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Alfred, could I ask you about this dichotomy between inside and outside, uh, Daniel's artistic identity and practice is very defined by its relation to the external world, um, using materials from the world, presenting itself often in the external world. Do you see any, uh, any kind of tension, or what can you say about the tension between that uh, source and that definition and bringing the work into the, the, the hallowed space of the museum? Coming back to the Strasbourg exhibition, I was lucky enough to, to see it. And I have to say that um, I first saw an image of, uh, on maybe on the internet, of the, the interior piece, the one that Daniel just described. And I was really puzzled. Uh, I said to myself, what the hell is this? Uh, what is it doing? Uh, because on the image, you, you don't have the scale of the, of the objects of the exhibition. So, uh, as, because it looks like uh, a children's game, uh, you, could, you could think it's this size, you know, on the image. 
And, uh, and then I was uh, lucky enough to see the exhibition, and I was very impressed, I must say, by uh, the way uh, the, the, the public, and the public when I came was extremely numerous, uh, many, many people were in the room, and how the public uh, adopts the piece, works with the piece, looks through the, the holes, um, which this was really quite impressive. And I, I wondered, um, well, first I, I was interested in the question of scale. I think you mentioned the scale just before, because um, the scale of your uh, interventions is uh, always connected with the, the size of the stripe. Uh, which is always the same. But uh, in that case, because of the, um, the design of the piece, um, and you cannot help with the impression that it's, uh, it's an enlarged uh, uh, model, uh, of, uh, it's enlarged from a model which would be the <laughs> children game. So that uh, that's makes, for me, a, a difference with other, other exhibitions other projects. And the other difference I, I thought, as I, I felt it, was the polychromy, the, the, the use of color, which is very, very specific in, the, in this piece. So I wondered, um, how would you place it in, in your work? Is it, is it something new and different, or is it uh, in direct connection with other uh, projects? To say it differently, I think that this piece could never have existed, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. <laughs> this is certainly true. Because Joel would not have invited you, <laughs> okay. but that's not, it's not the only reason. Thank you. <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, I mean, many other people can uh, say something similar, but I think uh, the, the work now, I can also have a little uh, possibility to see back, of course, when I look to some uh, work I did in the last um, 45 years or more, <laughs> uh, I can see myself so much uh, differences, enormous, which make me laughing because so many people said it was always the same. I really realized <laughs> how they are blind, but this is another story. <laughs> so. I think in this uh, long lane, then you have uh, some time, uh, some jumps, or you have uh, some uh, way back, and it's always you know playing mm -hmm. that way. So it's uh, stupid to say, but I think this work I can see a lot of links with other works I did, mm -hmm. and I think also for other type of reason, it's completely new in. Uh, because when you speak about polychromy, that's something I use since years and of years. Mm. So this is not really the new aspect of the piece. And construction, I also do that since so many years, which I call the exploded cabin or thing like that. But it's something different. So it's relate, related to that. And it's, I agree completely, uh, something. Also, I took took uh, for me some, uh, I mean, some days, if not weeks, to get accustomed to the piece. May <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I say something? Sure. About the past. Uh, Nicholas Oxdale. Um, I just wanted to say something very quickly uh, or briefly. I've known Danielle since about 1970, some around about that time, I think. You probably have a better memory, you remember the exact moment. Anyway, we don't need to go into that. Um, but what, and we've just shown at Freeze in, in London some early works. And so it got me thinking about these early um, striped paintings uh, again. And, and connecting that up with the recent developments over, well, developments not even recent, over 40 years and more. Uh, so two things I just wanted to flag up. Firstly, the original use of the stripes and the designation of the stripes as paintings and art with a, stripe of, with a, ha with a painted by hand stripe of paint to designate simply that it's art, not stripes. Right? Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. uh, very simple perfect sort of conceptual idea of the time. 
uh, you've maintained the use of the stripes as a kind of uh, way of keeping you on track, I think. So the stripes are kind of in parenthesis framed by something designating it as art. So it means, in fact, you continue to use the stripes because that is a groundedness within which there is this vast framework of work that you have made which is also humorous. And I think that something people miss is that there is something deeply buried or, or obvious sometimes uh, that there is a, a great humor to the work, um, both as a humanistic humor, your engagement with social ideas and so on, uh, but also a humor about uh, the, the intellectual claims and, and one might even say pretensions of art sometimes, because you work with that in, in, a, in, a, in a very complex way. Okay. I just wanted to uh, ask, about, ask that rather long question. If we start with the very beginning of the use of the stripes as, uh, as the beginning and as, uh, as the end, because that was really the only thing visible and shown, uh, the road as being uh, pretty open. And uh, I think the change was very quickly after I started in 65 to do these linen uh, pieces. And as soon as I decided to quit with the idea of studio, etc., and I was completely naked in front of where to work, etc., and I started to work in the street, right here, all around, uh, I think my work changed completely. And of, of course, to just jump from what I wanted to do as a reduction of painting, as a basic problem, basic question, etc., all of a sudden to work outside was opening a very simple question, what, what I am going to do outside? And of course, I, am, I was not going to take uh, my pieces of linen and to put it somewhere, etc. It was impossible, so the, the fact of using what I knew the most and the best was Paris, and posters in Paris was really, even more than today, something used for any kind of manifestation, politic, uh, etc., etc. And I thought the best would be to use this wall. And with what? My connection was very simple. I took the same uh, lines than the one I was using, taking the linen as a, as a background to do, let's say, the kind of a painting. And I did not suddenly realize uh, right immediately that it was, in fact, a big, big jump. And I think uh, I am still really in front of that field which uh, I opened for myself as soon as I worked out Side. I still don't have any studio. I work where I am invited and use the museum, the galleries, or sometimes uh, urban uh, sites. And then the, the use of the stripes completely change. And I think, especially at that time, now I don't think it's still like that, but especially at that time, no one saw the difference. They said, oh, it's stripes, it's again stripe, etc." But as soon as I use the stripes, as I did it in the street, and I come back to the galleries and back and forth all the time, the stripes were not at all used the same way. It was never anymore something like a painting or something like something to even look at. But it was, as I call it, a, a visual tool for a lot of possibilities. And uh, I am still using it in that way. That's also the reason it changed physically from a situation to another. Plus the fact that it's also become a kind of, uh, of uh, a ruler, which I can play. Let's say I can do something where you, don't, you will not see even stripes. 
And if some people were taking time to calculate, they will see it's a multiple of the size of the, of the stripes. So they are always somewhere, even when they are not visible. But they are all, somewhere it's always visible anyhow. <laughs> so the change was enormous from that period. And I think I'm still working with, uh, with the stripes. After everything I know, ah, yes, uh, we can recognize, or it's uh, like a signature, signature etc. I agree, it's uh, becoming certainly also a signature, but I never heard some people saying the full work of uh, Matisse or Picasso are stupid because they wrote their name somewhere in the painting. So. <laughs> Let's speak of scale a bit, because it's partly a question of scale, of addressing a public context, but also addressing public uh, space. And artists increasingly are offered huge spaces to, to fill or to engage with. And Alfred, I wondered if I could ask you, if you, with your two Versailles projects, Versailles is a pretty big space, pretty massive uh, historical uh, connotation. Uh, working with an artist, how do, you, how do you even approach the scale? Do you, do you tackle it as a challenge, or do you try to moderate it? Do you try to find the way in to well, make an I, intervention? I, I'm very lucky because I'm not the artist. <laughs> so um, I, I just really? try in the, in the two exhibitions I was involved with, Benoné last year and Liu Fan this year. I just try to accompany the, the artist and, uh, and you know there are a lot of difficulties in the space like that, technical difficulties, uh, uh, heritage, I mean, patrimonial yes. uh, difficulties and so on. So uh, there are moments where you have to readapt or maybe uh, change some locations or some uh, uh, intervention that the artist has in mind. And then you, you are there to help um, going through this uh, moment. I think the, 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 uh, the main uh, difficulty in a space like that, and uh, you, you just mentioned that Daniel did a piece in, uh, in Versailles using the perspective, uh, is, uh, is at the same time to, uh, to, be, uh, to affirm a, a, a work of art in the space, not, not to be uh, invisible, I, I mean, in, at, at least in the, in the cases I mentioned, not, not to, to be discreet, but on the other hand, to, to uh, understand and uh, respect the, 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 the space where you are without uh, where the disturbance uh, has, has to be a, a way to complement the, the space. Liu Fan uh, uh, said several times that he wanted to reveal hidden parts of the, of the space, of the garden with uh, his works. And um, I think that's the, the big issue. So again, uh, the artist has to face, uh, I think, quite uh, important difficulties to, to be involved in, uh, in such a project. But on the other hand, a, a little bit uh, like the Monumenta program in the Grand Palais where Daniel did uh, his piece uh, recently, it's a uh, it's, um, fascinating challenge, even if it is certainly, I suppose, more difficult for an artist to deal with this kind of space than to deal with a more uh, classical uh, ex white cube, let's say. Let, let's Maybe it's not more question. difficult, yeah. it's different. Yeah. You, you, you've, you've done many projects on a grand scale, the Grand Palais, the Palais Royal, um, the Bastille recently, last year. Um, do, you, do you enjoy that challenge or would you wish people would just stop asking you to <laughs> fill big spaces? <laughs> Uh, it's it's an ambiguous question because you know I based all my work since 1960 end of 67 to the site so all my work since that time which is many years it's only working with the uh, with the ID fundamentals and the site uh, not is making the work, but the site is part of the work. And of course, a uh, museum site is as much part of the work I want to do as a uh, place which is uh, behind uh, my back. So uh, the problem is, of course, always different from, first of all, inside and outside. Then, uh, the size of the work of, of the given space 
has a big role, but it's as interesting to do something in a kitchen as well as the <laughs> Palais Royal. It just uh, have to take care of the situation, which are obviously uh, almost having nothing to do together, uh, which also explain why, to go back to the other question, the work is almost naturally very different from one place to another, because if not, it will be to maybe take uh, the mm. same element and to put it everywhere mm. in the world. Mm. I will never mention anyone, but some people are working like that. <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> no, but just to say no, no, for, so. for myself, it's always a challenge and it's always extremely interesting to try to see or to make other people in front of uh, something which exists it's why I said all my work, for example, and that's a big, big disconnection with 95% uh, of the production of art, is not autonomous. So when you said it's not autonomous seriously, you really uh, take out what is autonomous or so-called, mm. which mean 97% uh, of the production. And it's not a critic, it's just to make <coughs> A big difference between these two aspects. You said in your interview, I think, with uh, Marc Sanchez for um, uh, Monumenta uh, that you aim to make your projects precise and coherent but leave uh, maximum liberty for the viewer, which is another difference from many artists. And I wonder, Joel, do you find that? Do you find people using uh, Danielle's work as a, as a space, as a, as a place to be? And Yeah, just, uh, is it necessary? You, you hear me? Okay. Right. Yeah. Just uh, Alfred say uh, he saw the piece with a lot of people. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, this is very, very important. And people uh, walking or in the light or inside the room are making a sort of choreography. This is a part. Mm -hmm. And you can see sometimes people uh, by the hall or people very far at the end of the piece. And two, uh, when uh, you are uh, walking in the big uh, piece uh, of the front of the museum and in the light, so it's another experience. And anyway, this introduces the fact <coughs> that to discover this work, is a problem uh, of sight, of course, but it's too a problem of sensorial experience in which you can uh, uh, associate a lot of things from your point of view of viewer. Uh, and it, finally, it's a very open work than, uh, that uh, Daniel proposed to us. With something which has surprised me at the first time is uh, the fact, perhaps you can see on the pictures, that you propose to the viewer a major point of view. And uh, very often you say there are a lot of point of view, uh, and that's true. But uh, all the piece inside is uh, organized from a major point of view. Uh, and this is quite new in your work. Or mm. not quite new, but you don't no, do this so, uh, so often. I mean, <laughs> if you take all the works I did with framing, you yes. also have yeah, this. Yeah. Right. Yes, and of course. <laughs> of course, but this is special because we were speaking about uh, visual tool. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me the visual tool you can see only on the circles who make the room seem uh, open to the infinite. And this use, for me, was linked to, to what I say this summer at Le, Le Corbusier Roof, and something open to the infinite by the visual tool. No, no, I think in, it's... In a uh, new way. <laughs> but it's... Uh, luckily for me, I always use it in uh, many different ways, and it's certainly not finished. So, of course, they have a kind of a presence <coughs> which will make the work open to certain direction, even if it's totally, I think, open to the people to really... S uh, the only thing I do when I make a work is to have the possibility uh, as open as possible where people can put themselves 
he's uh, walking everywhere and uh, and and just uh, passing by as well as uh, making a decision they prefer to look the to the work from this place or to this one but not for myself to say you have to be there to see it that's a big difference so if the people realize at one point when they start to speaking about Strasbourg to walk all around that at a certain point they can align their eyes like with a, with a gun to the end of the room I, it's absolutely fine but if someone said I am much more interested by the angle from the diagonal given by the rhythm of the white and the color, etc. It's fine too. It's many, very, very multiple. And as multiple as it is, I think better is the work I, I can do. And that can work as well in a small scale. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly a little, uh, in a way, easier to play with all these elements when the scale is uh, vast. But if anybody has any good kitchens they can offer them? To you. <laughs> Could we ask if anybody has a question? Should we open it up? Yeah. It's interesting to me when I, uh, before coming here, I decided to do some more research uh, into your work. And I kept coming across this phrase, the controversial, uh, the controversial installation that you had done at the Grand Palais. Now, I don't recall at the time, of course, it's been 30 years ago. I don't recall it being uh, extremely controversial, but maybe it was. What do you say to that today, um, that it was considered controversial at that time? Were you referring maybe to the uh, Palais Royal uh, installation? It's I mean, controversial, that's the most controversial. You know, it was other things which were controversial. Don't forget that, for example, in uh, 71, I was five from the Guggenheim for some controversy where I was excluded from the show. So not to say that I like that. I didn't but know that, but I was only <laughs> 21, so I wasn't paying attention. So. But anyhow, uh, it's a lot of, uh, I th it's, it's a lot of reason, I think, with the big uh, controversy which was given when we start the work just uh, behind. I think it's the first work and I don't know too many examples in the world where, in this uh, occasion, a state gave an historical space for a living artist to do something. It's very, very rare. Even today, it's not so frequent. In France, m I guess, much more than any place else, for some reason. We are not so much always in advance, but there I think we are pretty good. I mean, the, you know, who will uh, imagine to give the Chateau de Versailles and the Park of Versailles to make uh, exhibition as they did now since almost 10 years? I don't see places like that. You cannot touch anything. And I think in America, maybe even more impossible because the historical trademark is untouchable. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, so that was one of the first, if not the first, in the public uh, uh, side. So I think that make many people very, very nervous. Not especially against the work they don't even knew before it was built, but about the idea to give sub such a place for uh, someone. And uh, to make the story very short, what was also striking it's after a huge polemic which really uh, get all the friends and f uh, it was also in the middle of election and that was part of the fight uh, between uh, right and left, etc. As soon as we get the permission, because it was also stopped by the justice, and so it was back on tracks and we finished the work, as soon as the work was open to the public, the full polemic fell down. Even the one who were absolutely upset never took this occasion to say, look now, it's so bad, etc. So it was absolutely finished. Mm. And since, since that time, the, the piece has been, which is not a proof it's good or bad, but has been adopted by many, many, many right. people 
who play there, who come there, not speaking only about <laughs> the tourists visiting Paris. But uh, so it's really a flip flap, absolutely extreme between a huge uh, polemic and rage to the point of uh, destroying the work to something which is now more or less part of the landscape in Paris. One more question. And, and just a, a question, uh, something, because if some one of you goes just to see it after, which is very interesting for someone like myself working in situ, which means taking care and then to have something where, of course, change the place as well as something to do with the place, but it's not the same as soon as the work is done. You have a fantastic example here of a very interesting and difficult problem when the, ch when the place itself, and we are speaking about the historical monument, changed drastically because they built something else in the middle of the place. So the Palais Royal, since now more than three years, I think four, they built a theater and they are right now demolishing the theaters. You work, for example, there also with the idea of this uh, natural perspective given by the architecture and the view through, through the columns to the garden, etc. Since four years, you have a building in front. It's going to be clean, but that's a very interesting thing about, you know, work in situ, but the problem is when the situ just disappear. <laughs> Daniel, this has been, even by your exceptional standards, an exceptionally busy year with Mexico, with the opera, with Baltic. We haven't even talked about an yeah. amazing show um, with uh, Marseille uh, and, and Strasbourg. Uh, and each, as we've talked a little bit about, each project has a very different approach, a very different point of view, some similar elements, but a very different way of working. With all of these projects, have you learned anything new about your own work after 45 years? <laughs> I mean, it's maybe ridiculous to say it because I never, a priori, expect such a thing, but the, all the projects you spoke about uh, just uh, break totally the audience. And I think that's the only connection between all these projects. It's uh, every, uh, every situation can be museum or something special like the roof of Le Corbusier in Marseille, the work at the Baltique or even the work at the Opera. That's more like a group work, of course. Uh, really uh, bring many, many people and uh, they all have uh, this characteristic, which for me, it's, I mean, I will not uh, say it's a bad sign, but it's a very, very strange connection between these very different work, as well as the one in Mexico, which has been uh, uh, prolonged, extended, extended to uh, six more months. So, <laughs> so working. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle, for your generosity and for your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.